Uh, today we're planning on going over some multi-packing simulation techniques in vSIM. Uh, to give you some background on me, I'm Peter Nielsen. I'm an applications engineer with TechX. I've been involved with TechX since about 2010, I think. Um, and in that time, actually almost since I started, I've been doing some work related to multi-packing. So to give some background on what what multipacting is, it's a uh, basic and what it, you know, or as, as it's sometimes known as a multipactor effect. Basically, what you get is a resonant electron discharge. You can imagine you have an electron bouncing between two plates. When it hits one of them, it produces some secondary electrons. If it produces more secondary electrons than get absorbed, this can lead to an exponential growth and can damage and destroy devices. This is a particular problem in vacuum electronics. Um, what we'll be studying in these set of examples is often actually coaxial cables, but they apply across a large number of microwave devices. And multipacting is uh, a somewhat interesting problem to simulate as it's very difficult to predict. There are many factors involved, such as the power, size, frequency, space between plates, that all interplay together. So having a analytic solution for you know, knowing multi-packing will or will not occur is very difficult, which is why we simulate it. In case uh, anyone is new to this presentation, that needs a quick background on what vSIM is. It's a complete simulation package doing finite difference time domain uh, field solves with a particle and cell code. Uh, to give you a little, a little bit of a hark here, vSIM is the complete simulation package containing the computational engine known as VORPAL, as well as the setup, analysis, and visualization tools that's known as Composer. Bring this up because some of the papers we'll be referencing here actually will mention VORPAL, and for all intents and purposes of this simulation, a VORPAL simulation occurs in vSIM. So, as I had mentioned before, multi-packing is something that has been studied in vSIM for quite a while as it's a significant problem that vSIM is very well designed to simulate. And we have in the past had our results verified against competitive simulation tools as well as experimental data for benchmarking. Going to play here a quick video. This sort of showing, this is all actually vSIM data on multi-packer occurring in a coaxial cable needing a strip line waveguide. You can see the fields oscillating here and the particles moving up and down, their weight increasing. In this case, their weight meaning that more particles are being released. Now, one thing when you're doing a multi-packing simulation is you need to be very careful with your secondary emission model, meaning you need a secondary emission model that will allow for multiple electrons to be released from a perfect electric conductor with only a single electron impacted if the amount of energy is appropriate for that to happen. So this is a little video demonstration of a former, if we have a simple model here, you can see it moving up and down with the number of electrons staying about constant. Whereas in the Furman Pivy model that we've been using, you can actually see this increase in your, as the electrons spread out. And as we look at this, you can see there's the bulk of electrons, but then also some leading and flagging that this is a result of multi-packing as time goes on. Simple model, those electrons actually start to get absorbed. I would note these two simulations were both run within Vorpal and they had the so all the other factors were the same. So 
So the first thing we'll look over is a standard multi-packing example. If you happen to have an evaluation copy of vSIM, you can find this example under vSIM and the multi-packing, multi-packing growth. What it is, is a coaxial cable with constant weight electrons, the electrons being loaded with no velocity. A wave is shot down the coaxial cable and we just count the number of electrons produced. I mentioned before, in we use the Fermin Pivi emission model. Now, this emission model is a as two materials most commonly used would be stainless steel and copper. Those are both presets available from VSIM. If we look at the results of this simulation being run with the two different types of materials, we see that the multi-packing effect occurs in both and is very similar. But crucially, look at the difference between the number of electrons produced with the copper model being about 10 times 10 to the third near the end of the simulation. Whereas with stainless steel, it's about 35 times 10 to the third. So we can see that stainless steel is far more likely to exhibit multi-packing in this simulation than a copper material would be. If we look at this same example overlaid with the measurement of the gap voltage, the gap being the gap across the coaxial cable, we can see that each of these expected increases, you know, dramatic increases in the secondary in the electron population occurs with the ramp up in the gap voltage, then remains constant, this moves back down, the electrons come back again to hit it, increases, down, increases, down, then increases, this showing this sort of exponential growth would destroy the device. Now, this is one of the studies that was done comparing multi-packing, validating it against the experiment. This was actually taken from last year, Tobias Oliver compared the results of vSIM against this paper from Perez on looking at the secondary electron yield function where green is the experimental data, orange and vSIM, and sorry, orange and blue are both vSIM data, where we are sweeping over a range of frequencies and voltages and looking for the multi-packing threshold. Here's another paper. This is the results from another paper. This was calculated by Dr. Stoltz, who actually spoke just before me back in 2010, when they were benchmarking vSIM against experimental data and CST data. In this graph, we can see the secondary electron yield for given amounts of power after 20 impacts. This is a standard measurement used in multi-packing calculations to, is to see what the electron population, what the secondary electron yield is after 20 impacts on whatever you're worried about producing multi-packing. You can see around 400 kilowatts and above, we got excellent agreement with the experimental data. Below 400 kilowatts, uh, they started to diverge. This was actually believed to be a result of thresholding of the way that the collection method for the experimental data was done. It basically just started to have a th drop off at too low a power. So in this case, it was actually believed that Vorpal may have produced more accurate results than the simulation, or sorry, than the experiment due to the collection methods of the experiment. Oh, I, yeah, I can answer that right now. From insulator surfaces, um, or could you expand on an insulator meaning a dielectric surface? We have you there, Bob. Uh, let me I'll type one out as well. Uh, there we go. So, 
So dielect so dielectrics uh, have been studied in eSIM for multi-factor effects. We're looking to expand and further validate those capabilities uh, with vSIM 11. It's an area of active development, but it has been done by users in the past. Now, one thing we'd also like to get into with this talk on multipacting is not just the simulation of multipacting, that is, you know, attempting to take a physical problem and describe it exactly in the simulation environment and reproduce what you might see in the real world, but also run some diagnostic capabilities that can allow us to learn a little bit more about why the multipacting is occurring. And we can take, to do this, we can take advantage of the fact that we are in a simulation environment and not a physical environment. So we can learn some things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to learn. Now, in vSIM 10, there's three key features that allow us to do this. We have field scaling electrons, what we call our prescribed field solver, and field extrapolation. And so I'm going to go over all three of those, showing some examples of how they're used and how they might be used in simulations even beyond multipacting, starting with the field scaling electrons. So what a field scaling electron is, is a special type of electron. Uh, it's not a physical electron. There's one physical electron per macroparticle. Uh, if you're an experienced user of vSIM, you might be familiar with the term, the RELBOR's VW scale is the kind if you're familiar with the tech setup. And these types of electrons, they'll only work with a small number of them, a small charge of them. Otherwise, they can impact the field solve. And they're demonstrated most readily, again, if you have a vSIM trial available to you, in the vSIM MD multipacting, multipacting resonances example. The idea behind these is that you can scan multiple power levels simultaneously where each or each group of field scaling electrons will have a single will have or a single voltage assigned to them and you set a range of a minimum maximum and number of points in between them so effectively what you're doing if you're simulating multipacking with field scaling electrons is a simultaneous parameter sweep. Rather than having to take the same multi-packing growth example and changing the electron power level, you know, 80 times, we can do it all at once. This also prevents the need for modeling all of the electrons generated by multi-packing. As you can imagine with the exponential growth in electrons, a simulation can slow down significantly as you're trying to track all of those electrons, whereas in this case, the number of electrons will remain the same. So for the example we'll look at in multi-packing multi resonances, once again, a one meter long coaxial cable has an inner radius of eight and a half millimeters, outer radius of 19 and a half millimeters. Wave gets launched from one side, and on the other end of the coaxial cable, there's an open boundary to exit the simulation. Have a frequency of 867 megahertz on this with a gap voltage of two volts. And we load the coaxial cable with a number of electrons with a minimum scale factor of 2,000, maximum of 6,000, and 80 points in between. Basically meaning we are looking at 80 electron levels evenly spaced between 2,000 and 6,000. So to give a little you know, image here, this on the left is how the simulation starts. And this on the right, you can see the number of the growth and spread of electrons at simulation end. Now, when we look at these field scaling electron results, we can see this on the left is midway through the simulation. There's basically three power levels starting to form. These are the three resonant bands that electrons at this voltage would multipact. So you've got 
right? About 3,000, 4,000, five and a half. And then if we let the simulation run further, we can see the group right about starts to refine around maybe call that four and a quarter is really the dominant resident mode. And the other two do exist, but they're not nearly as significant where the, this one here is three, three and a half times less. This one ends up with just a bit over half the number of electrons that our dominant resonant power level finds. And these field scaling electrons are available for any other simulation needs that you might have. Uh, basically what they do is each time the electron reflects, it has this, what we call the field scale param, a counter in it that increments every time another one gets produced rather than producing more electrons. And this allows us to track the electrons that are being produced with, at, a, at a single voltage level rather than having to assume the same voltage level for all of them. To also help with this, we have the prescribed field solver. This is something that we introduced in vSIM 10.0. And the prescribed field solver is a little bit interesting. It does not actually perform an electromagnetic solve. What it does is it will import a electric and magnetic field mode and then give it a prescribed time variance, setting that field at each time step. So the, when you do this, the E field and the B field don't interact and the particle charge does not impact these fields. This is good, very useful, especially when working with the field scaling electrons where concern can exist on the field scaling electron itself impacting the field solve. Won't happen here. Uh, so what this is mainly used for is if you have a mode that you've calculated and you want to excite it at a given frequency and amplitude, you can excite it at precisely that frequency and amplitude without any other impacts. Now, our prescribed field is something that can be generated from a VSIM generated mode or a function defined. And in fact, with a little bit of a workaround, you can have a ANSYS generated mode profile imported into VSIM and used for this. Uh, if you'd like to see a demonstration of the ANSYS importing, we do have a YouTube tutorial specifically on that on our YouTube channel. Um, the one limitation when you're importing these modes is that you need to be on the same grid as the simulation. At this time, interpolation or resizing from the, a mode calculated on one grid to another grid is not yet available. Combined with our prescribed field solver is what we call field extrapolation. This is something that if you're using the prescribed field solver, it's automatically included. There's nothing that you have to do to add to enable it. What it basically is is a sophistication of the standard Demetra update used on cells that have both a PEC and vacuum in them, we would refer to as a cut cell. And what it does is it looks at the cells around it to see how many other cut cells are around it, how many other full cells are around it, a PC. And this enables for a more accurate field solution in those cells. Now, this extra step of field extrapolation is something that was added, particularly when we're concerned with multi-packing, as we have the, if you're worried about the multi-packing effect, the field in that cell that is cut with the conductor and vacuum right near the intersection. That's really what's going to control if multiple electrons are produced or not. Slight deviations in the electron's velocity or incidence angle here can impact if you know three electrons get produced on that impact or if it actually ends up getting absorbed. So, this, 
For an example of seeing prescribed fields and field extrapolation in action, we we'll recommend looking at a VSIM multipacting multi growth prescribed fields example. This example makes use of all three things that we've discussed today using our field scaling electrons, spherical cavity, and making use of our field scaling electrons and performing an extrapolation with a imported mode file. That imported mode file was previously calculated for a spherical cavity. Effectively, there's a sphere loaded with electrons excited at a given mode. So if we were to look at the results of this multi-packing growth in prescribed fields, one thing we can particularly look at is this being the raw field on the left is what was imported. This is being the Y component of the field, which is rather small. And when we extrapolate it, we can see that there's actually a little bit stronger field here, here, whereas it's a bit more spread out in our raw field, seeing something similar here, here. And you can also see these little jagged pieces here. That's a result of the grid discretization. And we get a little bit better resolution out of the extrapolated field versus our raw field. This is the X component of the same field. At the same time, you can see what we started with, it was a raw, very circular field as is expected with these edges here becoming much more better defined with a little bit of seeing this little bit of variation here where we know that see that the field is actually a little bit greater here than it is here on this edge of the sphere. So with that field extrapolation, then this is something that this is a subject of future expansion, is this will be available for any PEC grid boundary object, any of your imported CAT data can you use this. So in our future efforts to expand some of these capabilities, we're looking at the expansion of the firm and PIVI model that we use for easier tunability and testing, basically allow a user to say, okay, want stainless steel, but let's modify our stainless steel by 10%. Let's make it a little bit easier to emit electrons, a little bit harder to see where they really are on that multi-packing threshold. And if they happen to be close to it, or if there's a fair amount of distance between them. And then the other thing that is still sort of an ongoing piece of development would be secondary emission from dielectrics themselves, those being incorporated into our firm and PIVI model specification. So are there any questions available on multi-packing or on any of the other features that we've added to help enable multi-packing? What are the demos available in our test codes? Um, so let me pull up, I'll actually, so I actually will pull up right here, I'll pull up vSIM to show you exactly where they are and, and how to access them. Just give me one second. So if you open up vSIM, do a file, I'm sorry, I'll go a little bit slower. File, new, from example. They're all a part of the microwave devices package as multipacking is really a largest problem for microwave devices. And then we have this entire group called multipacking where you have multipacking resonances and waveguide multi-packing growth and waveguide, and multi-packing growth using prescribed fields. So if I select say multi-packing resonances and waveguide. And one of the reasons I'm selecting this one is it is a rather quick simulation to run so we can run the simulation and watch, look at our results develop in real time. So here, 
It's our setup window. You can see this is our meter long coaxial cable. You set a number of constants and parameters, such as our outer radius, inner radius, frequency, gap voltage, energy and electron volts. Here we can see our CSG has been used to create the coaxial cable. We launch a wave from one side using these two functions, fx and fy, those being amplitude times the sine of omega t times the driver function, driver basically being the coaxial, the coaxial cable. Then we look at our particles, our kinetic particles here. We call them electrons, but you can see this kind field scaling electrons. Those would be added by adding, say, test particle species, because they aren't really physical particles. We absorb them at the upper and lower ends of the simulation, basically preventing them from escaping. Here is our electron particle loader. This selecting our minimum scale factor, maximum scale factor, number of scale factors, location of them. And you can actually see it visualized at the bottom there. If I turn off our coax, you can see this block right here is where they'll all be loaded in. We have a secondary emitter right now being copper, assigned to the GB absorber, which is the entire coaxial cable. So now that the simulation is saved, we can run it and it has about 8,000 time steps, but once we get to a few thousand, we'll be able to start visualizing useful information. So once we visualized, we can look at our E field. Clipping it along the Y axis. At time step zero, there's nothing. It starts to grow. Let's see it propagating down there. Perhaps EX will be a little bit better to look at. Yes. You can see this field moving down the coaxial cable. And this time we can look at our electrons. Clipping. Yeah, they are initially loaded inwards and back in the center of the coaxial cable and back outwards. And if we look at our bins, Bins. It starts off rather 
chaotic. We're about halfway through, so I can reload this data. You can see as the time evolves, percentage increasing 